Thank you all for coming out this Saturday. Yes, we do deserve a round of applause. Hope you had plenty of caffeine. Uh, we're going to have a nice discussion here this morning on a very important topic for our community for El Paso. I'm your state senator, Jose Rodriguez, and I'm here to welcome you to this uh, discussion. And uh, we've got some uh, very, very uh, important people here this morning to discuss the subject of uh, not only historic preservation uh, in general, but also the ongoing uh, struggle to preserve Durandito, the oldest neighborhood here in El Paso. Uh, so first, uh, I want to thank you all for your interest in learning more about this and choosing to spend part of your Saturday with us. And I want to start out by thanking a number of people because I think this is important. I want to start with J.P. Bryant. J.P., would you please thank him? We're going to hear from him in a while. Uh, uh, J.P. Bryant, as you all know, has been leading the charge on this along with uh, Max Grossman, David Romo, and others, Dr. Yolanda Leva. And um, we're very fortunate to have him here with us this morning. Uh, he is the owner of the Gage Hotel. Uh, down in Marathon and the founder of the Bryan Museum and he is a supporter of the legal efforts to save Duranguito. Uh, he will be your moderator today. All right. Uh, thanks also to our presenters. I want to name them. Amy Webb, Senior Field Director. You're going to meet her in a while. Uh, she's with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Evan Thompson, Executive Director, Preservation Texas. Dr. Troy Ainsworth, Executive Director with Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, Bruce Elson, President of the Texas Historical Foundation, and Dr. Michelle Magalon, who is the Executive Director of the Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation, a very impressive array of experts in the field of uh, heritage and historic preservation. Uh, and I want to again, of course, mention and thank several other people that were uh, involved in this effort, uh, starting with Dr. Max Grossman, uh, my wife, Carmen Rodriguez, who is here today, who's worked on this extensively. Veronica Carvajal and the lawyers of the Texas Rural Aid Program. Uh, Dr. David Romo, Dr. Yolanda Leiva, and dozens of groups that have opposed the destruction of an historic neighborhood that is pure El Paso for an arena that in no way is unique to our city. Uh, I thank the scores of people who have gone to city called to the city council meetings, written letters to the editor, and otherwise participated in the public conversation. I also want to thank the residents uh, who are here, Tonita uh, and uh, Romelia. They're the ones who are still in the neighborhood and saying, this is our home. And also the hundreds of people who have been to the neighborhood to see what was happening over the last two years since the city first officially stated that Duranguito was the preferred arena location. And on that one fateful day in September 2017, to prevent the city's illegal attempt at an early, early morning demolition. I thank the thousands of people who signed not one, not two, but three separate petitions asking the city not to destroy what cannot be replaced, the origins of urban El Paso. Now, the thousands of us who have engaged on one level or another ask for nothing less than to hold the city to its own values. As expressed in the city's own award-winning El Paso plan approved in 2012. That plan calls for the city to, quote, actively consider historic qualifying neighborhoods, unquote. And it also calls for the city to create housing downtown and to, quote, continue to identify, protect, and encourage the preservation and rehabilitation of El Paso's existing historic resources. Now, there is a debate, as you all know, that we are having now about what kind of community, what kind of city do we want to be? That's the broader question. And I believe that we can develop and grow while at the same time respecting special places that are key to where we've been and who we are as a people, as a community. This arena plan fails in, in this basic value and on many other counts. It's not too late, my friends, to change course, to figure out a compromise that lets us all move forward 
together with an agreed upon vision for the community that incorporates our heritage, our culture, neighborhoods, and, and our people. Something like what you will see and hear today. In its overarching vision, I think it starts with the affirming words in the 2012 plan. Here are but a few goals and policies and quotes in that plan as I come to a close. Quote, promote downtown El Paso as a living classroom for historic preservation and architecture education. Use El Paso's designated historic districts and structures as an integral element in citywide revitalization and economic development efforts. Further, it is important that decision makers are aware of the social implications of each proposed change to the physical environment, unquote. So this is what our own city plan uh, articulates. A wonderful vision, don't you think, for, for what we're all about here today. So after you hear from our distinguished experts today and see the vision of what is possible, of what is possible as an alternative to what's being proposed, and this is a vision created by architects Diana Ramos, Victorio Hugo Soto, Andres Armendariz, and videographer, because you're going to see a video shortly, Ingrid Leva. And in consultation with neighborhood residents, I hope you are inspired to continue to engage in this fight, this very important fight for who are we, what do we want to be. Write letters to the editor and to city council. Let's take this message beyond this other court and to the whole community so that we have a better understanding of what this is all about. We're not, let me say this, most of us are not opposed to an arena. We're opposed to the location where it's proposed to be built because of the historic nature of that neighborhood, the beginnings of El Paso, as you will learn. So let's take this message as far as we can. Thank you very much for being here. I would like to now uh, introduce Dr. David Romo, who, as many of you know, is a historian. He's an author. He wrote The Ringside to the Mexican Revolution, uh, an underground history, by the way, of uh, information that normally you don't find in regular textbook, textbooks about the Mexican Revolution. And he is also the facilitator for the community-generated plan for the rebirth of Duranguito. He will be uh, discussing the video that you're about to see in terms of what is the potential for Duranguito and this effort to preserve uh, our heritage. So I'd like to call Dr. David Romo to the podium. Thank you all very much for being here today. It's an incredible honor to be here today. And, and I see this as a meeting of two dream teams. There's a national drinking of some of the most eminent, incredible uh, preservationists from Texas and the United States. And we also have a local dream team whose two videos we're gonna uh, present today. And it's a, it's a team and, and I'm super grateful. They, the work that you're gonna see today was the result of like probably 10 days. And, and, and I think you're gonna be blown away. Uh, Diana Ramos, uh, Victor Soto. By the way, Victor Soto is also both an architect and, uh, and an artist, and he belongs to a group called Los Visionarios, the visionaries. And I think this whole team, including Andres Armendariz, Ingrid Leiva, I see them as the visionaries of what Duranguito could be. It's a, it's a dream that, uh, that I think all of you are going to be blown away by. Basically what we set out um, back in, in 2016, there was a brief period where the city said, uh, we're gonna take Duranguito off the table. And this vision began with the residents themselves. And some of them, there's about four or five of them here that went door to door, building to building, and created an alternative plan for the rebirth of Duranguito. There were some of us, Dr. Leib and myself, that the first time that they heard that their, their neighborhood was gonna be destroyed to build an arena, we went up to them and said, what would you like? I mean, do you want us to support getting better, uh, better situation someplace else? And all of them unanimously told us, no, we wanna stay here. We love this home. 
But first, we don't want it to be destroyed, and second, we want it to be fixed up, to be made better. And so that was the vision that planted the seeds to what you're going to see today. Basically, um, uh, I, we're going to start off with a, a flyby 3D digital, uh, and then secondly, we'll, we'll show you another uh, video produced by Ingrid Leiva that has the narration. And what we're trying to do is right now, as you know, the Ranguito is damaged. We don't necessarily want to hide that damage. We're going to fix it up, but incorporate it in this new design. And it's based on this Japanese philosophy of Kintsugi, that they take broken objects and they, fit, they, they mend them together with gold epoxy, with the idea that something that has history actually has more beauty. So you're going to see in the design how we incorporate that, how we turn, how we have a vision that if they say that a city without a past has no future, how do we turn it around? How do we incorporate that past to have a greater future for all of us? And second, what you're, you're going to see here is a plan that is truly inclusive of all social classes, of all ages, uh, of, 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 of different parts of people that can come and feel like they can participate in this common dream. That's what you're going to see today. So why don't we start off, and then um, Max, I'll just tell you the parts of that, that I want you to uh, stop at. So here, why don't we stop right there? This is the Flor de Luna building. The Flor de Luna is what you see in, uh, it's actually a flower called Flor de Luna, a moonflower, and, and you see on the design, and you see right there where there's, there's a hole, but what you're doing is the epoxy. You're, you're using that and incorporating it in the vision. So part of the street will be to restore some of the residential services, uh, a yerberia, a health clinic, you know, the people that live there will still be included, but it will be a place that will also bring, like here, the Chinese American Cultural Heritage Center that will attract tourists from all over the world. So you're, you're walking through the artist alley right now. And we have wonderful muralists that could participate in that. And then you'll have open air performance and recreation spaces that include the people from the area, but also, once again, bring in, bring in tourists from literally all over the world. So to understand that this is a draft, this is the first conversation of what this part of our city can look like. So the, the famed uh, fire station number 11, the Trost uh, building, uh, would be a proposed children's museum with uh, banners on the side that you'll see that showcase our history. So that's the entrance, the welcome sign to Old Town Duranguito. And so part of the vision of the residents is that they, many of them want to return. And so they want to come back to restore renovated, dignified housing that's based on our architecture. So Andres Armendal is actually designed uh, a low-income housing that will be based on the Franklin School that was constructed in 1991. And so that's Romelia's house, Bonita's house. All of it, once again, to restore the vision, to renovate it, to make it better. And then you're going to see a community garden that we've already started planting the seeds. So this part is right next to where one of the most famous local musicians lived back in the, in the 1930s. And so we created a, a place that includes children, a, a music park. They can go and jump on the pianos and, uh, and use uh, and the architecture as part of the musical soundscape. 
And that was where Michael Dolan, Pancho Villa's attorney lived. Some of the oral histories actually placed Pancho Villa in that building. And that would be a site for a future Mexican Revolution uh, museum. And so those three buildings are part of, would be part of the historic Benazia Escarete Stevens home. I could go on and on about her, but it's as important as, uh, as the MacGuffin home. And that would be part of a global uh, uh, migration history corridor, a place where you could showcase the history of this neighborhood. Durangito is the birthplace of the modern city of El Paso. It's the city's oldest planted neighborhood. It was officially known as the first ward. And because of its geographical location for centuries, it's been located at the crossroads of major historical passageways and trails. It's the site of El Paso's foundational settlement, the Ponce de Leon Ranch, established in 1827. So the area houses several of the city's most important historic buildings, including the last surviving edifice of El Paso's early Chinese community. There's Victorian era homes constructed in the late 19th century by prominent fronterizo families. And there's a 1930 firehouse designed by famed architect Henry Tross. Each one of its buildings tells the story of a thriving commercial center where immigrants from all over the world make their homes. It's a place where newcomers intermarried into powerful families and where working class people build railroads and industries. Together, the people of Duranguito transformed this desert oasis into a cultural capital where the world met the border. And today, many of its residents still believe their neighborhood's seminal history is worth preserving and restoring. Para mí, Duranguito es muy importante porque, como lo he dicho otras veces, son los, es el, los primeros barrios, es nuestras raíces, son nuestra historia y tenemos que conservarla. No me gustaría por ningún motivo que se destruyera porque es lo que tenemos que presentar que les tienen que presentar a, a los niños del futuro, que tienen que decirles, aquí comenzó el paso, aquí es el paso. A year ago, the city tried to demolish Tunanguito, and ever since then, we have established a community in resistance. Currently, we are practicing an ancient Japanese philosophy of Kintsugi, which is to repair and restore broken art. And we are applying the same concept here in Duranguito, where we would like to beautify the neighborhood and make it more modern with murals and art and other beautiful cultural things to attract the city and all of its members so they can be a part of this great historic neighborhood. Mi nombre es Romelia Mendoza. Tengo como 40 años viviendo en el barrio Duranguito. Yo llegué cuando estaba bastante joven y era un barrio pues muy alegre. Había muchos jóvenes, muchos niños en, en ese tiempo. Y a mí me gustaría que ahorita 
las cosas se pusieran de nuevo como estaban antes o mejor. Porque este es un barrio que es histórico y a mí me gustaría que mis sobrinas que crecieron aquí vinieran de nuevo a ver este lugar ya reconstruido, que se viera pues, mejor que como estaba antes. Y también mis nietos, porque ellos ahorita están un poco chiquitos, que no pueden comprender muchas las cosas, pero a mí me gustaría que ellos vieran todo este lugar donde su mamá creció. Y uh, pues es, era, era para nosotros muy bonito estar en, todos, todos reunidos en ese tiempo. Fueron creciendo, se fueron viendo pero me gustaría que de nuevo ellos vinieran un día de estos a, a ver las, las cosas, pero no como están ahorita, como estaban antes, o mucho mejor. Como, ver, como verse florecer de nuevo, como se veía en aquellos tiempos. The many features they are planning to put in Durangito remind me of the Dr. Seuss books I read when I was little. One of the features that caught my eye was the giant piano in the music garden. I can just imagine jumping on it or actually trying to play a song with it. It makes me think of places that I dreamt of going to. The other thing that got my attention was the giant chess game. I have enjoyed playing chess with my father very much, and to be able to play chess with him with life-size pieces would be amazing. Most history museums are boring, but the new Duranguito will be a fun environment where kids will want to learn about history in a way that will be more fun than how they teach us at school. For me, seeing the rebirth of Duranguito would be like a dream come true. JP Bryan, I just really want to give a sincere thanks from especially the Durangito community. First time I, I, I heard you speak, Mr. Bryan, was when you spoke in front of the Texas Commission. And the, the eloquence and the, the compassionate speech that you gave made me think now there's also real mensch. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, and once again, this mission is about a dream. And today we do come in the spirit of compliments. It's a dream that maybe some other sectors don't agree with us, but we want to create a place where both dreams can, can exist. Thank you very much. speakers and then I'll, I will, at the conclusion of, of their presentations, uh, will make a, a few comments. But let me say, uh, as an introduction to their speaking, that all of them and myself come here to gain no financial advantage from this event, to just get the advantage that comes with, his, with restoring something of historical significance. And in this case, something of incomparable historical importance. All of us that are going to be talking to you today speak in a common voice. And that common voice is our recognition of the value of historical preservation. We do just not talk about it. We live it every day in our lives. And what we observe here I observed it after having seen the rendition from some proposed architect that was to, to present, present a new design for the, uh, the multi-purpose art and entertainment center that was going to replace or be placed in the Darren Depot. It was a nice rendering, but what I was disturbed about was the entire destruction of this neighborhood. So I took it upon myself to walk the neighborhood. And I then began to realize that there was an incredible opportunity here, an incredible opportunity to do something that would have enduring value for all the citizens of this community and the great historical preservation opportunity is here available to all of you today. 
And all of your speakers recognize that same thing. And it's the reason they came here. Not because we paid their way to come here, but because they believe fervently in this project. And I will say to all of you here today, you can either embrace this idea and restore this community, and you can destroy it. And it will be gone forever. The choice is yours. You, as citizens of this community and members of the great state of Texas. Thank you. Let me introduce our first speaker, Amy Webb. She's a senior field director with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Amy. We have to share devices. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, heritage tourism has been my entire career, um, 33 years working in this field, um, 25 of which I've been at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, I'll tell you that um, when the National Trust first began working at Heritage Tourism back in 1990, we decided to explore uh, work in 16 different pilot areas in four different states. One of those states was Texas. And one of our pilot regions was right here in El Paso. We actually worked on the Mission Trail. Um, so when we were trying to figure out what it took to make heritage tourism successful and sustainable, um, all of you or you know, all of El Paso was really part of that experience. So that's a little bit what I'm going to be talking to you about today. actually uh, put together a definition for, for heritage tourism, and you can see it here. Um, it is that uh, heritage tourism, and, and again, ignore the cultural for right now, heritage tourism is traveling to experience the places and people that authentically represent um, the stories and people of the past. And you'll notice that when we, um, over my career, we thought about um, heritage and culture and really the fact that they are so intertwined. And we ended up putting together a new definition for cultural heritage tourism. And as you can see, the one word that got added was and present, because we really believe that um, to make something dynamic, you need to look at what are the things that were valued historically, and then what are the things that people care about today? And that's extremely important. So um, I think Max has a, a one pager that we can be sharing with all of you that has some of the um, statistics in cultural and heritage tourism that the National Trust uh, has put together over the years, and, and we really looked at, at the economic impact of heritage tourism. You can see the things here. 76% uh, of all leisure travelers like to experience culture or history when they are traveling. So that's something which, um, again, the majority of travelers are looking for those kind of experiences. Um, we also know that cultural and heritage travelers spend more money than other travelers. This is a, a study that was done in 2013, uh, a national study. Um, but it's something that we have seen at the National Trust at the local level, um, at the state level. Um, every single study of cultural and heritage travelers that's been done um, shows that they, in fact, do stay longer and spend more money. So from a tourism perspective, um, they're a very desirable market. The other thing that's really important about cultural and heritage tourism is that it has some great quality of life enhancements as well. With cultural and heritage tourism, you have opportunities to um, provide new amenities for people in your community. Um, it's a way to diversify your local economy. Um, and again, just so many things that it, it can do. Here in Texas, um, cultural and heritage tourism is also important. This is some information from the Texas Historical Commission and some things that they've developed um, to look at Hispanic heritage here in Texas, which is a, a very important part of, of Texas's history. And again, I think here with the THC, they have found that uh, heritage tourism is important as well. Uh, it's a $7.3 billion industry here in Texas. Again, this is according to the Texas Historical Commission. Um, 
And it also accounts for about a tenth, you know, one in ten trips uh, here to Texas. So this next slide um, talks about what we learned in the Heritage Tourism Initiative that we did back in the 90s, which actually included El Paso. Um, you'll see that in the center we talk about collaboration. Uh, heritage tourism is very much about working together, and that means um, working in with other geographical areas. It also means trying to bring everyone together with different interests, whether it's preservation, local government, the arts, uh, Main Street, economic development. All of these different things can play into heritage tourism development. Um, one of the cornerstones of heritage tourism development is making sure that you preserve and protect the resources that you have. Uh, I've been to communities where people say, we really want to do heritage tourism. We used to have this great thing. You know, we, we tore it down, but we think we can build it back. And it's like, no, you know, unfortunately with heritage tourism, uh, if you lose something, if you lose those authentic resources, that's a one-way decision. You can never get those back. So when you're thinking about heritage tourism, you've got to make sure that those things that are important parts of your community are, are cherished and, and are really preserved for future generations. Another thing is making is looking at uh, focusing on authenticity and quality. Again, you know, you can't build these places back if you lose the real thing. Uh, heritage travelers are looking for authentic experiences, the real places where history happened. So that's really important. And as travelers who spend more money, they're interested in quality. You want to make sure that you really do these things right. Um, it's also important to, um, to find the fit between the community and tourism. One of the principles in the National Trust is that we really uh, prefer to see things that are places that are good for travelers to come, but also places that are um, valued by residents as well, that local people want to come and they want to come back time and time again. So you're not really only catering to the local community or only to tourists, but really providing a place that brings everyone together. And finally, looking at something that really helps to make sites come alive, those, those experiences that engage all of your different senses, uh, the sense of, of taste, the sense of, of smell, and, and ideally, you know, doing things, really getting people very involved in, in the experience. So I wanted to share with you a couple of examples uh, to just show this in action. And uh, with the, a couple of these examples come from uh, my own hometown of San Diego, um, which is also a border town. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Old Town San Diego. Some of you may, uh, may know this. Um, in the 1960s, this became a state historical park. There's also a city park that's there. And this is an example of a place that really has combined uh, both a place that, that does cater to travelers, there are wonderful restaurants that are there, there are um, places to stay, there are, are great shops, the Zar del Mundo has all kinds of incredible things that you can buy. But there is a very strong local community there as well. And I was talking to um, Marie just this past week, who's a descendant of some of the original inhabitants um, in Old Town, a combination of Mexican-American and some Native American blood that came together there. Um, and she talked about how living in Old Town has been so wonderful. It's, it's changed over the years since the 1960s because uh, there, is more, there are more travelers that have, are coming in. There's more visitor things to do. Um, but that's also created some business opportunities for the local residents. It's still a very tight, close-knit family. Um, I asked her, I said, so Marie, has it, has it been, um, do you feel like it's been gentrified? Have you had people who have had to leave because it's become too expensive. San Diego has become very expensive. And she said, no, in, in fact, you know, one of the things that they were very lucky about is that many of the homes were uh, owned by families. And so those families have made sure that when they pass those, uh, those buildings down, they pass them to members of the family or they rent to people from the community. So they've really retained this very tight, close-knit community. Um, she said, yeah, you know, I can't walk to the grocery store at the end of the block, but I can get there in six blocks, so it's still okay. Um, so Old Town San Diego is, is a place that really has uh, looked at uh, combining those. Another example uh, that I wanted to share is the Gasland Quarter. And we've actually got a video that we're gonna try to show about two minutes of that talks about the beginnings of, of, uh, of this. When I was growing up in San Diego in the 60s and the early 70s, this was a place that you didn't want to go. Um, I still remember my mother saying, okay, you know, roll up your window, lock the doors, we're coming into this. They didn't call it the gas lamp quarter back then. 
but it's an area that has had uh, just tremendous change. Um, in fact, in San Diego, when you look at the top 10 attractions in San Diego, they talk about the zoo, they talk about SeaWorld. Inevitably, the gas lamp quarter is up there as one of those 10 attractions. So let's just watch about two minutes of this and, and see what, how this got started. I'm Tom Hogg. I was born and raised in uh, San Diego, and I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, Fifth Avenue was the, uh, the, the artery of downtown San Diego, and I, I'm, I'm glad to be part of the new changes. Well, it was in about 1973 when I left government. Uh, we have a lot of uh, adult bookstores, go-go places, and so what can we do about it? In working with the community, we formed the historic district, was taken on to be officially the gasoline quarter. I can remember when it was pretty dangerous to be down at the gas lamp, and uh, it's amazing the transformation that's occurred um, on 4th, 5th, and 6th Avenue. There was a group of property owners who owned property in what is now the gas lamp, and they felt there was something that they had down here that was could be more than what it was. What happened in the early 70s, there was an awareness by people that said these amazing historic buildings should be preserved. And we should make a movement to do that. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of enthusiasm. We experimented with social programs, we experimented with development programs, uh, everything we could do to try to get some excitement down here, some changes down here. So around 1982, that's when it really started to change. Ernie Hahn finished the Horton Plaza, Walt Smyth finished the first high rise, and things had fundamentally changed. Every day, it just seemed like it got better. That sign really identified the neighborhood and made it stand out from the rest of downtown, which wasn't as developed. But there's a sense of place, and a sense of, I have arrived, I'm in the gas and quarter. And if we have that feeling, they have arrived, and I believe we will be arriving too. It's it's an exciting time, and that's coming right up. Um, so that just gives you a, a quick little preview of, of what's, what's happening there in the gas lamp quarter. Two really different examples. I think um, in the gas lamp, um, they did not actually preserve the community, sense of community there. Uh, the last example that I want to share with you today. Um, is, uh, is up in San Francisco. The National Trust was actually just up in San Francisco for our annual conference uh, earlier this month or last month. Um, and this is the Calle Diente Cuatro district, which is the Latino district um, in San Francisco and has gotten designation as a cultural district within the city of San Diego. Um, this particular example very much focuses on the local community. It's really mostly about the local community. Um, so they have gotten this official designation they are working at preserving um, the community, the people who are there. They're looking at uh, the different traditions. Um, and so it is, again, more uh, community-based than tourism-based, making it a better place to live. So just in closing, um, you know, one of the decisions that is, is facing folks and, and things that you need to think about are, you know, do you want to become just any place USA? Uh, there is so much homogenization and uh, generic development that's going on. If you look at the slides, uh, the pictures over here on the one side, um, those could really be any place in the United States. They could be they could be here in El Paso. They could be in El Cajon in my hometown of San Diego. They could be in El Reno, Oklahoma. Um, they could be anywhere. So there's not really a reason to travel to be able to see things like that. Um, also, with a lot of the, the big box development, and you can see here this this slide. You know, what do you do when your big box retailer, when your Walmart closes because the super Walmart opens? Um, those are places that are, are really more disposable architecture. The reuse opportunities are much less for them. So the question remains for all of you, what do you want El Paso to be? And this is not something that, um, that, that is up to me, it's really up to you, but I would encourage you, as you're thinking about those opportunities, think about those, those buildings, those places that are special um, to you, like the Chinese laundry. Think about uh, the different kinds of traditions, and it could be uh, the foods, what, what, if you're coming to El Paso, what are the things you really need to eat while you're here? What are the kinds of performances and, and traditions that you can see? Um, who are the people that make up these communities? 
And again, um, it may not be just the people who live in the community, but the people who really care about that community who are there too. They may have connections of, of people who had lived there in the past. So think about those things. And just um, finally, I wanted to close with um, a quote from um, Garrison Keillor. Uh, this was a, con a quote he made some years ago at the White House Congress on Travel and Tourism. But I thought it was so telling that he was saying, people really don't come to America for our airports and our hotels. They're coming for our culture, our high culture, our low culture. Um, this is what they want to see. So I encourage you as you think about the future of El Paso to think about what you have here in terms of culture to offer. Thank you. Well, that, that was a wonderful and insightful presentation. I'm sure all of you can understand that. Uh, two important facts that were brought out but not elaborated on and that is, of course, heritage tourism. And it begs the question, so how are we doing here in El Paso uh, with heritage tourism? Well, the sad fact is that heritage tourism in El Paso is the lowest among all the major cities in, you know, in, the, in the state of Texas. And that is in spite of the incredible uh, assets that you have here embedded in the city, such as some 150 buildings uh, designed by one of the greatest architects of all time, Henry Truss. And the incredible historical culture that was mentioned uh, in Amy's slide is people, as you notice, don't come here for the recreational facilities. They come here to look at the culture. And there's no city that has a more unique and diverse culture than does El Paso. So these are the kinds of things that we need to keep in mind and also, when we reflect on that, another sad fact is, it's been 26 years since this city nominated a historical district. Now, our next speaker is going to be Earl Thompson, Executive Director of Preservation Texas. Earl. Evan, excuse me. Where did Earl come from? You could be Earl? Twin. He's, he's sleeping somewhere. Thank you, uh, JP. And uh, does this come out? Um, I don't have prepared remarks and I don't have a presentation, um, but I wanted to talk to you about the experiences that I've had, not just in Texas but elsewhere. Um, I was the director of Preservation Society of Charleston for four years before I came back to Texas to become. Director of Preservation in Texas. Charleston is one of the leading, if not the leading, city in the world for heritage tourism. And it has been a centuries-long effort to get to that place. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But my first visit to, uh, to El Paso was five years ago. And I stayed downtown. I have a new fit phone that I have to look at to make it open. Okay. So, um, my first visit to El Paso was five years ago, and I was downtown, and you have beautiful buildings downtown, and at that point, many of them were still uh, in a vacant condition, and there's been remarkable transformation in the last few years. But after walking around, I wanted to see what else is here. This is interesting, but where do people from El Paso live? Where did the city really start? And the first place that I went was to what I soon learned was called Durangito. And, and some of the first photographs I took as a heritage visitor to your city was of that neighborhood. And what, it, what struck me was that that community represents the DNA of El Paso. Every community has a DNA that's embodied in its street grid, that's embodied in its early buildings, that everything is built on. And you can't have the El Paso of today without the El Paso of the 19th century that's embodied in these old neighborhoods. And it also struck me that it looked just like the photographs of Charleston in the 1920s, when all of the buildings were run down, vacant, 
filled with trash, broken buildings, and preservation is all about building that back. And it takes a really long time, but the investment is one that, that pays off in a way that is hard to calculate in the uh, short term. There's a John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, the economic historian said, you never regret having torn down a building. You, or sorry, you never regret having saved a building. Uh, <laughs> I think I just lost my job. <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry. Um, sorry. But saving historic buildings reinforces a sense of authenticity that you cannot replace. And I will say this, having been to many cities across Texas and across the country, from the 1880s through the 1930s, El Paso, of any city I have ever been to, has the most intact historic fabric in the country from that period. It is all here. You've lost buildings, of course. Every city loses buildings. Every city has the horrible interstate that cut through. But you have it here. None of it is expendable. There are plenty of open spaces that need redevelopment, and that will come. <coughs> El Paso has amazing historic resources. And I say that as someone who has been all over the place looking at the types of, of resources that, that um, we're talking about today. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that preservation is a, a movement in the sense that one investment stimulates additional investments. I think that in the last five years, you've seen incredible investment downtown. That will only spill over into adjacent neighborhoods. It happens everywhere that preservation takes root. The engine of preservation has already been started. It's happening. People are coming into downtown staying in hotels like the hotel where we stayed last night. Um, but there's more to a historic place than where you sleep. It's important to have a place to be when your eyes are open and it's daylight and you walk around and it's a neighborhood like during Gita that offers a lot of opportunity um, to connect downtown to other parts of the city. The state has enacted a 25% historic preservation tax credit that coupled with the 20% federal tax credit allows for 45% of restoration expenses to be a tax credit if a building is part of a historic district. Incredible incentives. Those are being used on skyscrapers. They also apply to small buildings. The, the amount of money you need to spend to qualify for the, the credit is $5,000. So it's a very low threshold to qualify for the credit. So there's um, important incentives for the city to encourage as well. I think the last thing I would close with is the importance of ensuring that a city has a strong quality of life. We talked in Charleston a lot about livability. And a city that celebrates its history but makes it possible to live within that context. And we spent a lot of time carefully planning where new buildings and new building programs would be placed in the context of a livable city. And it's important to spread it out and to have balance so that you can retain both an authentic sense of place and small scale historic neighborhoods while also having really great amenities like the beautiful baseball field. That is a, a wonderful place. I love it, you know, and we enjoyed that very much when our Preservation Texas board met in El Paso. We went to a game, <coughs> excuse me. And so there's, there's no reason why you can't have wonderfully restored historic neighborhoods as well as the 21st century opportunities to enjoy the entertainment and the sports and the arts that I think everybody really wants to see happen. And so I would just encourage you to think very hard about the opportunities that are here. It's a long-term benefit, and none of us will be alive with the true benefit 
of preserving El Paso is, is made real. So thank you all for being here. Speaker. Excuse me. Our next speaker will be Troy. This is Pearl. Uh, thank you very much, Pearl Evans. The, I think that the, the important of one of just the very important things to take a, away from what Evan had to say is obviously we're not talking about not having the site that is proposed, built. We just think it would be a monumental, so to speak, mistake to build it on top of the most important historical site in El Paso. And certainly there should be compatibility between something more modern, something in the 21st century, as was mentioned. We all think that uh, the field with a little Chihuahuans play, um, is a very attractive addition to the city. Um, so, and, and obviously attracts and has done much to inspire, I'm sure, other uh, compatible uh, structures or buildings in the, in the area. But we're looking at historical, uh, or heritage tourism and historical restoration, and that is something that endures for years and years, and it's something that the city doesn't have to finance. You don't have, as taxpayers, underwrite the cost of it. This is an example of free enterprise at its finest. Now, of course, it's getting tax incentives, which makes it attractive. But there's an enormous uh, opportunity that we're going to talk more about. But let's get on to it with our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Troy Ainsworth, who's the Executive Director of Camino Real de Terra Aventura de Los Lunas, New Mexico. back in El Paso. I've been in exile for eight years in far, far northern El Paso County, New Mexico. <laughs> so bear with me. I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to begin. My name is Troy Ainsworth. I'm with Camino Real Trail Association, a former historic preservation officer here with the city. Um, wear a number of different hats. Um, I'm very proud to hear many of the comments that are have already been made. And, and one thing I would like to uh, uh, reiterate, the, the comments from Amy Webb a few minutes ago, uh, I would like to just say, I, I, I would like to repeat everything you said, because it was spot on. And, and in preservation, as most of us are aware, it is so many of the blatantly obvious decision-making approaches, and yet, not everyone shares that same perspective, which is why we have these competitions over land, over competing visions of what a place should be, what its identity should be. It becomes a battle royale in many ways over the have and the have-nots. Uh, and it's a very interesting examination of human heart and conflict, as Bill Faulkner would have, would have viewed it. I've kind of distilled it down to three very basic questions in my mind. Because we hear a phrase that's been adopted here in El Paso, it's been adopted in communities nationwide. We know it. We know it by rote memory. El Paso, a great place to live to work, to play. Minneapolis, a great place to live, to work, to play. Orlando, a great place to live, to work, 
to play. We hear this nationwide, but it kind of rings hollow if you don't really have great places to live, great places to work, things meaningful, things to do. So you look at a distressed area in San Diego, California, that your parents say, roll up the windows, kids, and lock the doors we're driving through. To now, I can't find a parking spot under $35 for an hour because everyone wants to be right here. Okay, well, you can argue, well, San Diego, hey, come on, San Diego is San Diego. And we're not. Yes, we're not. I get it. I live just south of Albuquerque. I hear it there, too. We're not the big city. Woe is us. Woe is us. No. What we are looking at is the fundamental challenge to a way of thinking. Most of us, in our development, growing up, it's binary decision-making, right? It is either one or it is two. It is either choice A or choice B. On a more prosaic level, which do you prefer, Pepsi or Coke? You have two choices, right? So, we think about the built environment. Wholesale, new, so like Ledice, <coughs> Czechoslovakia, Warsaw, Berlin, Coventry, England. They all had to rebuild after 1945, but they didn't have a choice. That's what Mr. Goering's Luftwaffe, what the SS, and what the Allied forces were capable of conducting mass destruction. Europe had to be rebuilt. We're not in Europe. We have a choice, and not a binary one, but we have a choice about what we want with our built environment. Because it really does say a lot about who we are as people. I've been doing a bit of extensive research like most of you, I read the El Paso Times newspaper from 1881 pretty frequently. <laughs> My wife is convinced I am crazy. But most of y'all knew that already. I've been reading the newspaper from 1881, and I'm writing a, a, a section of a paper right now that's uh, going to be submitted to the Center for Big Men Studies uh, down here in Alpine. And I uh, had the distinction here a few weeks ago with Mark Howe, who's seated back here in the middle of the room, over on the edge. And uh, we talked a, a little bit about uh, uh, the river, about architecture, about El Paso. And one of the things that's pretty fascinating is, uh, um, uh, this is a great example of uh, uh, the phrase that history always gets repeated. In 1881, the El Paso Times, the editor at that time, a man named uh, uh, John uh, Comerford, wrote extensively about the need to tear down the adobes. Tear them down. So the plaque that you saw a little bit ago that was drawn in 1859 from uh, uh, Anson Mills, uh, or William Wallace Mills, um, you're looking at the plaque in that area, the first ward, the area that is, is the focus of our discussion today. In that area was, was the part that the, the, uh, uh, the, in the, the new arrivals in El Paso were saying, you know, we've got to get rid of all this adobe architecture. They're shared and, and inhabited by people, horses, and pigs, and we're more civilized. And, and I'm not making that up at all. I mean, that's in print in the newspaper. Um, and I'm really looking at this from a lens of, of race and identity and cultural definition and, and those factors. And I'm thinking of this in terms of that decade, the 1880s, and keeping in mind during Gito, and keeping in mind downtown, and really coming to grips with the fact that the more things change, dot, dot, dot. So I don't know what it really says about us. I know we've had a couple of Freudian slips up here, so since we are at the Psychiatry Conference 2018 in El Paso, maybe I can contribute one myself, I hope so. I really wonder, who pays here? And I'm not talking just in dollars. Who pays? In my mind, the loss of, or the wholesale loss of an area is an irreversible, irreplaceable community tragedy. 
I personally would not want to be a long-time resident of a neighborhood where most of my neighbors have been forced to relocate. And to know that my house, that my children were raised in, that my grandchildren come to see me, old man, living in a little house, all by myself, toward the end of my life, and to know that soon after I'm physically gone, my neighborhood is going to. There is something psychological on a very deep and humane level in which the places where we grew up, the places where we live, the places that we identify with, yes, they do change over time. But I really hope that you noticed, that you observed in the photographs in San Diego a moment ago, if you saw the historic black and white picture and if you didn't know that that was San Diego, California, you might say that was San Antonio Street, El Paso, at the same time. In some ways, I do want any town USA, but not the way you're thinking. Any town USA, the architecture in the 1880s, the 1890s, that was prevalent, commercial and residential architecture, had dignity, well-built, solid construction, and it helped identify an American place, which was pretty fantastic. And it happened all across the country, which is extraordinary. Now we see infill. We have the nice four-story brick building with the wonderful commercial building facade, and then there's a lower building beside it. And then you have the monumental block building like the Monarch Block here on South El Paso Street designed by the English architect George Edward King. And you see traces of this. That kind of streetscape appearance is shared in downtowns and many other communities. So I bring that example up for the specific purpose. We do not have to approach things in a binary manner. If you choose A, you must forego B, and on and on. Pepsi drinkers can enjoy a Coca-Cola now and again. It is okay. It's not a jailable offense. It's fine. In one of your slides, you had the, these five points, Amy, about the overall program for heritage and cultural tourism. You noticed the one that was in the middle of the five arrangement. It had two hands shaking. Right? Collaboration. We look at things as a them and us approach. And no, no one is going to come to El Paso or San Diego or any place of that nature to see the new Walmart, to see the CVS pharmacy on the street corner. Who pays? The cost is high, not just in monetary, but in identity, You've heard the terms authentic, authentic, uh, authentic and authenticity, uh, enduring value. Thank you for using that, that phrase, sir. Uh, Mr. Ryan, that's really what, we're, what is at stake. Enduring value. And that an arena in and of itself is not a bad thing. We can't demonize an arena because of what it is used for. The question, at least in my mind, and I think in many of yours, is location. What is the cost to impose after you take away decades and decades of history and, and in its place put down a great big sports arena? What is the cost? Physical dollars, memory, the maintenance of memory is so important. Is that a willing price to pay among a community? That is the question in my mind that is at stake. It is imperative, and I wish that in this audience there were a number of people who were very pro-arena, uh, revitalization, whatever phrase is befitting. I wish that they were in the room today. We are. They are. <laughs> Good. Because we need to have people on both sides present, cannot be a one-sided dialogue. It has to be open. There is a place for 
multiple perspectives. The two primary ones, preserve, revitalize, and of all the ancillary, equally important ones. That's my 10 minutes, my two cents. Buenas tardes, thank you so much. Well spoken, and I am glad to hear that we have um, the other side represented here. Uh, because the whole purpose of this gathering is to suggest that there is an alternative. And that's been one of the common questions that I have gotten from other people. Well, if you don't build on that site, what can you do? And that was, of course, the purpose of the renderings. And what we're trying to do here is not be critical of the city or anybody. It's to be positive in, in suggesting the fabulous opportunity that we think is available to everybody in this room in this city and give something that you can be enduringly proud of. I'm not going to say you won't be proud to take somebody out to, to a basketball tournament or to but watch a baseball game. But how much better and how much more enduring to take them to something that could inspire them and change their whole view of this part of the world. So I think that's our ambition today, is just to convince you that there is another opportunity here. It's the thing that drives me. Look, I live in Houston, Texas, and that has been well identified uh, in the newspapers and by everybody that wishes to talk about this event. Sure, I have a home there, um, or a house there. But you know where my home is? My home's Texas. And what happens in this state affects me one way or another. And my love is historical, the history of Texas and historical preservation. So if somebody is going to destroy something that I think is historically important, I'm going to at least stand up and voice my opposition to it. And in this case, I put my money where my mouth is. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, Bruce uh, Elson, who's the president of the Texas Historical Foundation. Uh, Bruce and I were both uh, long time, I have, he has uh, serving now, uh, but long time participants with that organization, who I can assure you will look very favorably upon providing financial support if the Darren Gita is preserved. Now, Bruce, have I put you in a bad place? But if I have, still come up here. <laughs> Before I begin, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of this meeting for allowing me to participate. This is certainly an august group, and uh, I feel somewhat humbled to be standing beside such experts. I would also like to thank Senator Rodriguez for his words of insight and encouragement. I'd like to thank JP for his leadership in facilitating this. And I would also like to thank the good people of El Paso for coming to this event. Civic pride and involvement are a hallmark of your city, and it is certainly evident here today. I'm a sixth generation Jackson who traces his roots back to the siege of Behar and the Battle of San Jacinto. I've lived in 12 counties in the state, from Midland to Corpus Christi, Dallas to Fort Davis, and many places large and small in between. I like to think my Texas roots run deep and wide. I also tend to think that my DNA, rather than being a double helix, is shaped like the state of Texas. <laughs> Currently, I have the honor of serving as the president of the Texas Historical Foundation, a position once held by JP, whose guidance was a major factor in forging the organization's character and an example for all who have followed in the role. I also learned two, two things. Never follow JP. He's a tough act. And, and second is, don't miss the meeting where they have the election. So. <laughs> the Texas Historical Foundation was formed in 1954 to fund what uh, was to become the Texas Historical Commission. In 1971, as the state assumed the funding role for the survey committee, as it was known then, THF began to independently seek out worthy projects, explore critical preservation, and establish endowments that supported programs around the state. This good work continues today, all supported by private donations. 
I am proud to say that next month we will celebrate our 65th year of serving the Lone Star Legacy. Also next month, THF will be awarding our 300th grant since 1971. of the Texas Historical Foundation. I won't bore you by reading it again, but uh, just to let you know that we are dedicated to the preservation of Texas, uh, all things Texan. Uh, we are one of only a handful of organizations, uh, and I believe six by the last time I counted, uh, that awards grants across the state from historic projects of all classifications. things that we've done, I won't, I won't bore you with uh, ad infinitum, but uh, some of the things that we've helped fund are the uh, Charles Goodnight House on the Plains. And let me tell you, nobody goes to Goodnight, Texas, unless they either have relatives there or they know about Charles Goodnight. This, uh, this uh, house is the singular largest attraction for that area, and it is a boon to the, to the, to the town. It brings people to the museum. Uh, there are some businesses that are uh, there. Uh, built up uh, along the heritage of the, uh, the old uh, Good Night Loving Trail and, and the, the cattle drives and things like that. So this, this single building sitting out on the middle of the plains that you can see from 30, 35 miles away, practically, uh, has been a huge uh, magnet for the people in that community. Uh, we've recently uh, contributed to the restoration of the last uh, uh, cannons of the Alamo that were used at the battle, the restoration of those. That was a very moving, I, I could tell you more about that, that ceremony, it was very moving. Uh, the, uh, the, I don't know, many people aren't familiar with it, but we do, we do cover all Texas history from 15,000 years ago forward uh, to today. And the, the Galt site is one of the premier locations in the uh, world, actually in the, in the North American continent, for archaeological preservation. Just recently, in the last two months, uh, they announced findings there that pushes the arrival of, of uh, humans in the North American continent back 8,000 years. So that just goes to prove that even in prehistoric times, people were dying to get to Texas. <laughs> Uh, we've also done some things to preserve uh, uh, artifacts like the uh, Texas Supreme Court uh, documents. And uh, I've sponsored uh, videos for education purposes. Uh, the Birth of Texas series is an excellent uh, tool for if you're a teacher. I recommend that you get it. And if you don't know how to get it, see me afterwards and I'll see that you can get it. Uh, we also do things with uh, publications like the uh, uh, First Women of Texas History. And, and we do things with museums as well, like the, uh, the Chisholm Trail Heritage System, uh, Museum in Cuervo. Uh, okay, this is, a, this is a little bit of an old slide, but it does go to show you that the, the, the primary point that I want to make is that the Texas Historical Foundation is interested in Texas. We are not specific to Dallas, we're not specific to Houston, we're not specific to El Paso. We, we are interested in Texas from Dalhart, down to Brownsville, from El Paso, to Beaumont and Texarkana. So, uh, and, and we're not specific to any given thing. We're not interested in trains, per se. We're not interested in, in cowboys, per se. We're interested in all of it. And so, uh, we have a passion for Texas, and uh, we, uh, we, we think that this effort that you have going on here is critical to every part of the state, just as much as any other of these things. Uh, 
the consensus is clear about, uh, about the findings on historic preservation. And I would like to talk a little bit about what I've learned uh, serving on a foundation for historic preservation. Uh, first of all, we don't get blisters, so we don't spend late nights uh, after long days in committee meetings, uh, and we don't squeeze every nickel just to get a period correct baluster for the staircase. You know, the fun stuff. Uh, but we do more than show up with a giant check, take pictures, and leave. Although we can never uh, get as close to the project as the preservationist, we care about its success and about them. And working with many groups, we get to see the macro view. And here's a little bit about what I've learned and aggregated from seeing so many of these different projects. As I said, first of all, the consensus is clear. Economic benefit of historic preservation is well documented, both the quantitative and the qualitative. Studies by prestigious institutions, such as the Brookings Institute, the National Park Service, Americans for the Arts, U.S. News and World Report, and closer at home, the Texas Historical Commission, all draw similar conclusions. Historic preservation pays both economically and sociologically. Government and civic leaders across the country are acting on these facts. One would be hard pressed to find a state that doesn't have a preservation plan in place, and many cities have them as well. Others on this panel are eminently more qualified, and that's obvious from what we've uh, heard, to discuss the economics. So I'd like to share with you a few of the lesser mentioned benefits of historic pre preservation that are enduring to the human spirit. First of all, uh, sharing. In my experience with the grant process, I cannot think of a single example in which there was a, uh, in which vanity was a major factor for a for an application for a grant. Certainly, pride was, and rightfully so, but the motivations were more noble. Primary among them was the desire to share a story not in a superlative manner, but as part of an ongoing dialogue that we must, that must be core to our mutual experience. <coughs> Anonymity and homogeneity are not where the goals. Understanding and respect are. Uh, selflessness. If anyone works on uh, an historic preservation project for selfless reasons, one of two things is going to happen. They will soon get fed up because the fight is much more difficult than they expected, as some of you can attest to. And um, history is best preserved outside ourselves, where it can be shared, debated, comprehended, passed on, and even grown. So the second thing that can happen is the recognition that the task is larger than oneself and worthy because that is so. Uh, bonding. Uh, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is to shut up and let a slide speak for itself. This is a, an example of, of a uh, pioneer days in Georgetown, and this little guy is learning about some of the earlier tools that uh, uh, were used by his forefathers, and I think that look on his face pretty much says it all about what Bonnie is. Uh, discovery. Uh, even if one likes, lacks an appreciation for the high and low water marks of mankind's ebb and flow. Ignoring one's own past leaves a personal void, a persona infectus, if you will. Whatever it is within us that drives the need for a social bond, also, perhaps more quietly, desires an ancestral bond too. And don't take my word for it. Cretan's uh, research valued the direct-to-consumer genetic testing market at $117 million last year. And that number is expected to grow by 20% per year through the year 2026. I find that exciting, not because I own stock in Ancestry.com or a kilt company, but because those ethnic pie charts are not so much answers as they are an invitation to a quest. And what starts as a solo sojourn, more often than not, gathers parents, children, siblings, cousins along the way. Family projects are born and relationships to distant relatives are kindled. Social bonds form from ancestral bonds. Old school. The 
the last thing, which I don't have a slide for, is uh, coalescence. Uh, the, obvious example, the obvious examples of coalescence is the, uh, the act of historic preservation itself. It gathers together a lot of people who perhaps would have never known one another and, and unites them behind a single event, which is, uh, it offers elevation beyond what anybody could have expected. Uh, but the, uh, historical, uh, the historically preserved continues to act. Uh, JP is one of the first of what I like to call re pioneers, those who recognize the potential of what was and make it so again. Marathon, in a large part, owes its, ex its existence to him. And if you haven't been to the Bryan Museum in Galveston and see what he's done to the orphanage there, uh, well, let me tell you, it's a, it's a pilgrimage we're taking even all the way from El Paso. And he's not alone. Uh, the small town of Cisco, in the county where I grew up, uh, has garnered a sizable tourist trade simply by the, from the fact that they had in town the first Hilton Hotel. It wasn't called Hilton at the time, but he's the one that built it. They've restored that, and uh, the community is, is, is bound to the mountain. I see somebody who's familiar with it in, in the audience, and uh, uh, they, they've, uh, they've attracted businesses into town. Uh, they, they have a brand new community center there. All of this because they recognize the historic value of what was. And I say that um, a, a little bit uh, jealously because I grew up 20 miles down the road, or I, I went to high school 20 miles down the road in a little town called Ranger. Ranger had 50,000 people in, in its, uh, its population at one time. It was an Auburn town. And uh, it arguably, and perhaps a little bit self-righteously, I think had a better history than Cisco. <laughs> but uh, uh, they didn't embrace it. And if you go to Ranger today, what you see is there's not a single business on Main Street. Uh, more than half the buildings there consist of brick walls with fallen and caved in roofs. So there's a huge difference that people bonding around history can make. And another one I'd like to share with you um, is the town of Nocona, which is even smaller than Cisco. Uh, they restored their downtown to a bygone era that has made it a gateway uh, to the Metroplex as a new generation seeks Sunday houses. I don't know if you're familiar with Sunday houses, but the farmers in the, in the hill country who live too far out, when they come in to do their uh, affairs on Saturdays, it was too far to go back out to the ranch that night and come back to church the next morning. So they built small houses in town uh, in order to be able to spend the weekend uh, when they came in. Well, uh, well, uh, Nokona, as a, as a booming business in that, all because they've gone and revitalized that downtown area. And it's not uncommon on a weekend to go out there and you will see uh, locals, semi-locals, and visitors all mingling in the restaurants and the streets uh, and walking on Main Street. It's just a remarkable thing what they've done with that town. And uh, people long for this. The, the people of the Metroplex are flocking there. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect testament to that. So, uh, in closing, I would like to pose a few questions for your consideration. At the end, how are we to be remembered, to be measured, judged against what matters? You see, built or built upon, legacy is the product of accomplishment viewed through the lens of time. No matter what we build, generations future decide significance, worth, and longevity. When we depart, our hope is that they are responsible with the scales. In their dash for the future, that they do not neglect the uh, past behind. Before they take off down the road, will they consider whence they start and why it is so? Who would be so foolish as to think they began at the absolute origin, from no reason, and with no obligation? And if we hold these expectations of those that follow, have we no less a bond to those who came before? How would it be possible to expect a legacy without honoring one? Not paying homage to the past is the abdication of one's own relevance in the future. <laughs> History matters. How we treat it matters even more. I like to think Texans cherish their heritage more than most. It dwells within our pathos. That is why uh, you're just as likely to come across an historical marker on an unpaved county road or near a rural cemetery as you are along the highway. 
Texans cared that history mattered, not that it happened conveniently. That is why the Alamo and Goliath still get goosebumps, and it's why we're here today. Thank you. All right, now at the uh, end of our presenters, and uh, shall we say we say the best for last? Uh, we certainly uh, uh, have a, a very compelling uh, talk uh, from Dr. Sh Sh Michelle Magalong, who's the executive director. This is very lengthy now, so I'll go slow. Asian and Pacific Islanders, Americans in Historic Preservation, Los Angeles, California. Thank you everyone for coming out on a Saturday morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. And thank you for having me here. Um, it's my first time here in El Paso. Um, and it's an honor uh, to meet many folks here who are passionate about um, the city's history and, and, and your, your work um, and commitment in preserving that history. Again, my name is Michelle McGong, and I'm Executive Director for Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. API HIP is a shorter version of our really long name. We are a national organization uh, focused on elevating the stories of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans throughout the U.S. and U.S. territories. So I get to travel throughout, um, including from the Pacific um, to D.C. Um, on a regular basis, uh, learning more about the history of Asians and Pacific Islanders and our contributions across the country and places that are threatened First, I'd like to ask, how many of you have seen a marker like this before? Raise your, raise your hand. And um, I would like to hear, where are some places you've seen um, this, this national marker? You could yell it out. It's not a, it's not a trick question. <laughs> St. Augustine. Boston. In Boston? The, is that what I heard? Boston? Yes. In Boston, everywhere in Boston. Where else? Well, in Genovese, Missouri. There are places across the country where you'll go and see um, this marker, which is, this is um, the, the National Historic Landmark um, marker um, with the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior. Often, when I ask this question, these are places that I get Right, like in Boston, everywhere. Um, these are our national treasures. <clears throat> then I ask, this thing is a tricky thing. Um, how many of you have seen a marker that is associated with women? Hispanics, Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, those that identify as queer or LGBTQ? Raise your hand. How many of you seen a national marker? So, and this is why our organization exists. We often get this kind of response. No one has their hands raised. Um, a, while, a few years ago, I said this is actually a game that's harder than Pokemon Go. <laughs> because uh, on the National Register of Historic Places and as National Historic Landmarks, um, Markers that are associated with underrepresented groups is less than 8%. For Latinos and Hispanics, it's less than 3 For Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, it's less than 1%. For the LGBT community, they have one. And that is recent, Stonewall in New York. And so these are a few of um, what we have that are associated with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, as you can tell, most of them are on the West Coast or in the Pacific. But they do tell stories of our, of our contributions as Asian and Pacific Islanders. Um, but here today, one of the places you know, that has been mentioned um, here um, in Garantito is um, a, Chinese, a Chinese laundry. Uh, for many folks, in the, you know, uh, the image that is evoked usually of Chinese Americans is Chinatown. It's the exotic, it's the foreign perpetual, uh, the, the perpetual foreigner. Um, 
somewhere where you go get to something to eat for a moment. Um, and so that is the image normally. But, you know, it's seen as that this is a tourist destination. It's, um, it's an amusement park kind of place. But what people don't know is that for Chinese Americans have been here, Chinese have been in the United States since its founding. Um, Chinese have served um, in the Civil War. This is an image that's used from the National Park Service on a study on uh, Asian Americans in the, uh, during the Civil War. And that also, as mentioned um, here today, Chinese were vital, they were crucial to the building of the railroads, bringing east, east and west of, the, of our nation um, together. And this is what has brought Chinese here to El Paso. Um, in 1882, um, after the completion of the railroad, um, there was huge uh, sentiment, um, anti-Chinese sentiment, um, especially with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act um, that brought out, um, that was trying to, um, trying to evict Chinese in different um, towns that were um, settling during and after uh, the railroad completion. This is in Tacoma, Washington. But um, as I mentioned, um, this is the, Am I doing it wrong? There it is. So this is Golden Spike National Historic Site. This is where the last spike um, was, was placed um, when the east and west of the railroad, um, the, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Um, this was the official photo. And just a few years ago, the descendants of the Chinese um, railroad workers came together and uh, reenacted the photo so that it was more accurate. <laughs> it was actually, who built it? <laughs> um, and that is something that's very important um, in telling our story as a nation. And so, as you see here, um, the National Park Service then included at Golden Spike in Utah, um, there's information now about Chinese Americans' contribution to the railroad and to the moment at Golden Spike. And so looking forward as our nation, we ask the question of how do we tell a more inclusive story? How do we tell all American stories? And you know, the National Park Service has become a leader in doing that and being more inclusive, um, saying Golden Spike is not, uh, wasn't designated as a Chinese American site. It was, it's an American site. Um, but they added the layer, or they placed it back in and highlight the layer of the Chinese American contributions at that location. And as a result, um, you know, there's a lot of tourists who come in from across the nation and throughout the world who come and, and get to learn more about that history. Um, and, you know, and it brought to the question of, well, what can um, this remaining site, this Chinese laundry, uh, in, in the neighborhood, what can it bring? It can bring questions of why is this important? It's a very sensitive thing. Um, it's a Chinese, it's, a Chinese laundry is the last remaining structure that's associated with Chinese um, in the early 1900s. It was erected in 1900. Um, it's located in the, um, in the neighborhood of Duranguita and it, it it embodies the complex and multicultural history of El Paso, of Texas, and of the Southwest. It was first the Chinese laundry, but as folks who may know, it has had many uses um, since then. And so it, this, this structure, it's not just a Chinese laundry, but it's, like a, it's, it's kind of like an onion. You peel it back and you get to learn about all the different layers, right? And how they built upon um, this one structure to meet the needs of El Paso and in the, in the building of El Paso. Um, you know, and it does reflect you know, the status here of the city as the Ellis Island of the Southwest. Um, you know, as, as immigrants, I use it as a place to, to, to um, build the local economy, meet the needs here. Um, and also it tells about a period where, as I mentioned earlier, in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, for a Chinese laundry to exist in 1900, 
with this Exclusion Act just you know, eight years prior is a testament of resilience um, you know, of, of immigrants here in El Paso and in the birthplace of, of El Paso. And so what is the potential here for um, remembering this site? Um, it's about not only the history of El Paso telling a, a more inclusive story um, and also being relevant to today um, for the city, engaging with the city's diverse communities um, as a growing community here of Asian Americans. And we're hearing, you know, there are um, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, Japanese Americans um, living here. And to, for them to find that they have had a footprint here um, for over 100 years um, so that they can feel, you know, a, a stronger sense of identity with the city and also so that other folks can feel their a shared identity as well to this story of place. Um, and what's at stake? This is the last remnant of the Chinese story here in El Paso, but it's not just about the Chinese story. It's about the story of the birthplace, as JP has, has mentioned, of the city um, and you know, what is the potential here? Um, and as I mentioned earlier with the National Park Service, um, really taking on um, these <coughs> places and stories, it also brings back in terms of um, cultural heritage tourism, where people are coming to places, uh, folks, we have a lot of folks who are doing um, tours uh, coming from China and from, from Asia, um, visiting these places. Uh, we just actually hosted uh, or co-partnered um, in Northern California last month where folks got to go just outside of Yosemite. Actually, Yosemite was one of the highlights because uh, one of the, the cook um, that actually built out the Yosemite National Park was Chinese American. Um, and so folks from China and from out the United States came, descendants came on this tour as they wanted to learn more about Yosemite and also of the Chinatowns in Northern California, just north of Sacramento. Um, and you know, it's, it's something of um, an economic boost for local economies and also for organizations to learn more about their history. And that also they're partnering with um, schools um, from K through 12 to colleges um, and having students come and learn and engaging with researchers. And so it's a multi-pronged approach about how the story of place not only is about you know, the story of one person, but how it can engage different, um, different communities uh, locally and, and bridge them nationally, um, statewide, internationally, and, um, and you know, really, as, as mentioned earlier, you can't, once you destroy it, you can't, you can't build it back. And, you know, um, and as a personal connection, as Amy and I had mentioned, I, you know, she had mentioned she's from San Diego and I'm from San Diego too, um, and that gas lamp was not a place you went to. Um, at, even as a kid for me in the 80s and 90s, you didn't go there. Um, and I actually um, started my work in historic preservation with the gas lamp. I uh, was, was learning about the Asian American community there. That sparked my interest about what is here and what can we save? Um, and how can we work with city officials? My training is in urban planning and learning at, at how can we make um, these historic places as places of economic development. Um, and also uh, in terms of cultural identity and maintaining that. And so I think that, you know, this is, El Paso can be um, a pioneer in this, in this next generation of preservation um, and, and telling a more inclusive story um, that really highlights the uniqueness of, of this great um, city. So thank you. Great, great job, Michelle. The, just to kind of uh, evokes the thought that maybe occurred to many of you while we were sitting here that talk about the Golden Spike. Uh, she was talking about the Transcontinental Railroad that drove the spike in Oregon. We had our own event here in Texas, as you all know, in Langtree. But think how wonderful it would be if the Chinese building was, laundry was restored, and we had an event that invited them to come to El Paso to reenact that special occasion. But invite Chinese from all over the world to come here and see what is transpiring in the Darien Beach. And think what that could bring to this city in terms of a unique combination with people from another part of the world. 
but also people who are very much Chinese, but first are very much American. Well, thank you, Michelle. That was a wonderful uh, talk. All of you talk. But let me just conclude with something that may be a little redundant in terms of what we've heard, but I think it's the important thing we need to take away um, from our meeting today. By the way, we're going to have a Q&A, so all of you who would like to cross-examine or, uh, or question us about anything that we discuss, we'll welcome that. We'll put some chairs up here and do that. But what we're talking about, let's say it one more time. It's the birthplace of this city. Think about that. We're not talking about a snow cone establishment uh, on the east side of town. We're talking about the foundation of El Paso, Texas. And we are preparing to destroy it. Now, don't you find that troubling? Yes. 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 Well, let me suggest to you, what if this was happening today in Dallas, Texas, for example? And we found out that, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this guy Brian had, and one other relative of mine, by the way, had something to do with discovering Dallas, and we thought it was over near the river, but we found out it's really here in this old neighborhood, sort of run down, it's been here a long time, it's got some historical buildings, but, you know, we're going to build a big high rise here, and we're thinking about, you know, a mass transit system, we'll probably make a good spot for the, the railroad to connect to the rest of the community. What do you think people in Dallas would have said? They'd have said, well, hell no. We're going to restore this, and they would have done it. So I think that, not in anger, but you need to rise up with a unified voice and say, we've got a better idea for what to do with this piece of land. We want to preserve it for future generations. And look, who came here? This is one of the few cities in this entire country that saw the combination of the Native Americans, the Spanish, the Mexican population, Anglo, and Chinese. Probably only San Francisco or maybe San Diego could make that same claim. And now we are looking at the last standing building. Who wants to throw the first stone at it? And have that on your epitaph as your epitaph for the rest of your life. Guess what? I destroyed the last Chinese building in El Paso. Hmm. Well, you probably feel about, about the way I do. But here's what we're giving up economically. The thoughts are not just about the Derendito, which if you look at the early history of El Paso, it is, covers 20% of the town that was originally laid out. So it's not just a little historical afterthought. Ponce de Leon was here in 1827. We know his ranch is buried under a sea of mud. And clearly, that was the birthplace of El Paso because nobody wanted to cross that Rio Grande River and face the Apache Indian until he did. And he set off an economic boom here in this city. But if you look at the greater opportunity in declaring a historical, historical, historical district, uh, in the Derringito and the surrounding community, there are approximately, and this is not exaggeration, this is by the county census, 900 buildings that would be eligible for historic designation and available for tax credits of 45%. Nine, a thousand buildings, if there was only $250,000 spent on each of those buildings over time, that's $250 million that would come into this community. That says nothing for the continuing traffic from out, out of towners, the heritage tourists that would gladly come here and do this. And matter of fact, many of the other things that are represented in this community. This could be the most traveled or most visited community in the entire United States when people want to examine historical architectural assets like Henry Troslev and the, the kind of cultural community that you have in the Derendita. So I would just say to you, if I had been Rupert Richardson, who started the historical, the Texas Historical Commission and was a famous historian, 
um, and taught uh, Texas history. Rupert Richardson went around to all the important historical sites on a bus and they would put up plaques and he would say to those gathered, take off your shoes. The, the ground upon which you stand is holy. Shake the dust from your feet. I will tell you, the Darren Vito to everybody in this room should be considered holy ground. Thank you.